we're going to get started. Uh, welcome back to Ford CloudSec. I hope you guys all enjoyed lunch. Uh, this is the true power of AWS tags. Before we start, I'd like to thank our sponsors, especially our gold level sponsor, WISSecure. Uh, WISSecure is, cybersecur is cybersecurity's reliable partner, the largest financial institutions, manufacturers, and thousands of the world's most advanced communications and technology providers. Trust with Secure for outcome based cybersecurity that protects and enables their operations. Check out their CTF. The details are on the Forward Cloud Sec page. And uh, yeah, check them out on uh, the hashtag Forward Cloud Sec. Thanks. Um, before we get started, for those of us in the room, please silence your cell phones and use the mic to ask questions. Uh, for remote attendees, uh, we'll be looking for questions on Slack and Twitter. Uh, and without further ado, please welcome Yoav Yanilov and Itamar Bereket. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Yoav Yanilov, and my co-speaker is Itamar Doi. Uh, we're going to talk to you about the true power of AWS, which is essentially a scalable uh, ABEX solution solving the who can tag what, if you may scale and how we use that solution to implement uh, two-person approval that's native and built in into AWS IIM. Um, those of you wondering, I cannot get my eyebrow th this, this up again. And, uh, <laughs> and today's agenda, uh, if you're a troll, is to first realize that ABEC is broken. And most of us already know that. Uh, and maybe trying to fix it and making, uh, <laughs> making an accident like that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, eventually profit. But the real agenda is actually asking you guys, who can delete an RDS cluster in your organization? And the answer I'm going to get is probably no one. But if I dive deeper, I understand that there's some sort of an admin user and a break glass protocol somewhere. And it's a system that sits on top of AWS. It's kind of hard to hack. But at the end of the day, you're still asking yourself, are, is this user secure enough? And can you prove that the user is, in fact, secured? Uh, this will be a fairly technical talk, so we do assume that you have some IIM knowledge uh, being provided. But uh, those of you coming from different clouds, uh, here's a quick recap. For any uh, in-flight request in AWS, you have tags, which are basically key value pairs. And they can be attached to the principal, which is the identity making the request, the resource, uh, in case the resource exists, and the request itself, if it's a request to maybe tag a resource. And one of the principal keys here is uh, actually the tag keys, which is a list of all the tag keys within the request. This part will be instrumental to the solution ahead. And when you're trying to enforce policies in AWS, it's, it's a basic uh, common knowledge that you're going to use an SCP. An SCP is just an IAM policy, but you attach it to an AWS account or an organizational unit or even the organizational root itself, and it affects each and every um, IAM principle within that account. Once you're trying to um, initiate work with SCPs, you realize fairly fast that there's quite a few of them, just five per organizational unit. And if you're going to try uh, an RBAC approach where it's role-based, you're going to get stuck pretty fast. You're going to have an explosion of roles. So you're going to opt for ABAC, which is a tag-based authorization. And Itamar here will uh, dive deeper into the subject. Right. <clears throat> so. Um, we all want to use ABAC, right? Um, it's simpler to define permissions. Um, let's say I want um, to deny anyone who's not an admin um, from deleting an RDS cluster. So um, I will do something like this. I hope you can see the IAM policy. Um, there's one statement. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we're denying um, all principles from deleting um, performing any delete action on RDS unless they have a tag is admin set to true. Now, this raises some concerns. Um, who can tag the tag is admin? Um, currently, 
anyone with the permission to tag or untag IAM principles can essentially privilege their es um, escalate the privileges um, and then uh, effectively um, get uh, permissions to the RDS clusters. So um, we propose to add another statement and this statement um, actually forms like a members only club um, in which you have to be a part of um, to um, add new people to the club. So you cannot tag or untag um, any principle with this now privilege tag unless you have this privilege tag. That's good, it will work. Um, but imagine you have to work with um, five of those tags or 20 or 100 of those tags. Um, you'll have this integrity logic kind of replicated and all mishmashed into the access control logic, which is what we're here for. So um, we want to propose a solution um, which will give us some separation of concerns. Um, we'll have the data plane, um, which will be as distributed and um, um, specific as we want, um, like the linear RDS cluster or who can access S3 buckets, um, like only Team Infra can access Dynamo T L DynamoDB tables tagged with Team Infra. And then we want to have another integrity logic in which this logic will be centralized in one place and as generic as possible. So we can um, split those two statements into tagging integrity logic and the access control logic itself. So how can we scale it? Um, when we were first thinking of how can we scale um, this approach and have this separation of concerns, we were thinking about a Unix file system. Um, let's say I'm in a server and I have two users. I have Alice and I have Bob. Um, Alice should have access to her um, home folder and her memes folder, um, but she won't have access to the system folder or Bob's folder. If I need to translate it into IAM, I can say that Alice's grant area is her home directory, meaning she can tag or untag any tag within her grant area. So she can tag um, slash um, home slash Alice, whatever. Um, but she cannot tag anything else. So that's first. But now we were thinking how we can give the permissions for users. I mean, how can we decide who can tag what? So this is kind of a problem, but if we'll um, come back to the Unix file system, um, we'll imagine we have a file under Meta. Um, it's called GrantPath. Um, the file has entries. Um, each entry is a username separated by a semicolon, and then we'll have the grant area for this user. So Alice would have her home directory, and Bob has his home directory. For, unfortunately, in IAM, we don't have a centralized file, um, so we'll have to designate a tag um, which will be privileged that no one can access. Now, this file um, is read-only file. No one can write to it unless they're using sudo in Unix. Um, and in IAM, we don't have the actual um, equivalent of sudo. So we'll keep that open, but we'll try to imagine that no one can tag this privileged meta tag who gives the permissions where anyone can tag. So um, the value of this tag will be a pointer to um, the grant area of uh, the user. This brings us to introduce control tags, um, which is our solution or our proposed solution um, to how can we scale uh, control tags in the cloud. So first thing first, a definition, what is a control tag? So a control tag is just any tag that starts with SWCTL. We did that um, during our times in similar web, so SW is similar web. Um, and all other tags that don't start with SWCTL are just regular tags. Right. So um, we're seeing now the whole, I mean, this is it. This is the whole um, control plane. We have only two statements here. Um, the first statement is kind of straightforward. Um, we say if you don't have any grant path set, then you can't tag any control tag. Um, you're not in the club. 
The second part, um, we can um, see here that we refer to the grant path. If we're tagging a privilege tag, we want it to be within our grant area. So we see the pointer. Um, grant path value is actually um, what keys can I tag. And then we'd have some legacy tag values that we want to support um, for not um, breaking the workflow for developers. And then we'd have info tags, which anyone can tag, they do no harm. So this is the control plane. Um, and there's a very simple recipe um, of how we can use it now. We'll take those two statements, set them as an SAP, we'll attach them to all our accounts. Then we'll write the access control logic, um, what, it, what actually do we want to do, um, set them as SAP2 or just a resource policy or identity policy, doesn't matter, and then attach them as well to the accounts or resources we want. And that's it. Now, let's revisit um, our first, first bad example. It's the same kind of statement. Um, we're still denying um, um, people that are not admins from building RDS um, clusters, but now we reference a control tag. We now say that you have to be either an RDS leader or an admin, or you have control of all control tags to be able to delete the RDS. Look how short it is. We don't have to worry about integrity logic at all. This is a great building block for the rest of the things we're gonna show you. And what if we can make it more secure? I mean, this is fine. Um, we can now control who can tag what. Um, but what if we can make two collaborating admins um, only when collaborating be able to delete an RDS cluster? Um, on this, Yoav will elaborate and we'll introduce our two-person approval mechanism. Approvals are nothing new. Uh, we all accept them for changes in production environments in our SCM systems like GitLab or GitHub but we've never come to expect them from our cloud infrastructure. And when me and Itamar set out to uh, um, approve similar web SOC 2 certification, this really bothered us. And we set out uh, the way by um, saying that the thing that we want to have to achieve the, the, the goal, the MVP, is to make it impossible for any single principle to delete an RDS cluster or an S3 bucket. First things first, we want to show you a pre-recorded demo to convince you that the system really exists and it works. It works in production for about 18 months now. And here you see two terminals. I'm going to call STS get caller identity and show you that the upper one is mine and the lower one is Itamar's. Next, I'm going to search for a bucket with my name. And it's called uh, something, something, delete me if you can. Let's try to delete that bucket, see what happens. OK, I failed because the SCP is connected. <laughs> Next, Itamar is going to give me a 2PA ticket, which is essentially an IIM tag, special IIM tag. And there I go again, attempting to delete the bucket. And this time it worked. Let's see if the bucket is still there. OK, the bucket was deleted. Some of you are asking yourself, what just happened now? Uh, the operation that occurred when Itamar gave me uh, an approval ticket is essentially tagging uh, my target role with an, I, an, an IM tag, which we refer to as a 2PA ticket. And without further ado, it looks like this. As you can see by the tag key, it's an admin-only feature, which kind of makes sense because it resides under the admin prefix of control tags. And the tag value is uh, the interesting stuff. Uh, it has to match up with the source identity, which is uh, AWS's notion of an identity within the system. And once it's set, it cannot be unset or changed if, in, if you do some role chaining. You're stuck with it. 
So this is the basis for the integrity of the ticket. Let's dive into the SCP itself for 2PA to see how it implements those guarantees. The first and probably most crucial step is inserting some sort of a organizational chokehold on who can uh, set a source identity. Uh, it's governed by a tag, a control tag, that sits under Meta, meaning that a single admin cannot set it. And we'll get to that later. And what it essentially does is says, uh, if that tag is not there, you cannot set a source identity in the entire organization. And what we're going to do is we're going to tag all of our IDPs, like Okta or some sort of other OIDCs, and maybe an internal credential broker that we have in the environment that dispenses ephemeral credentials to uh, developers with that tag. Second part is the anti-reflexive integrity, which is just a fancy name for saying I cannot approve my own tag, uh, uh, my own ticket, because otherwise it makes no sense. Um, Looking at this statement, it shows that if you're trying to tag a 2PA ticket and the identity, the source identity matches your own, you're denied. Anything other than that is not denied, meaning that I can tag every um, identity within the system except mine. The third part, uh, which is not crucial for the enforcement of the ticket, but is very useful for visibility, is actually um, enforcing the giver's uh, source identity into the ticket. That way you can just say I am uh, list uh, principal uh, tags and see what active 2PA tickets are on that role, who gave a ticket and to whom. Right. To recap, it's an admin only feature, makes sense. It has um, an identity uh, chokehold on, on the organization, meaning that only a predefined allow list of IDPs and credential brokers can eventually uh, uh, insert a source identity. It has anti-reflexive properties. And the one thing that we've uh, yet to specify is that it is payload bearing. We're going to use that payload to insert uh, a TTL, basically just a Unix timestamp, saying, uh, when that uh, 2PA ticket elapsed, and it's time to uh, delete it. Turns out it can't all be JSON, so we did have to write a little bit of code here, which is a Lambda function that wakes up every 30-something minutes, uh, queries the organization uh, to see which accounts, which organizational units are actually connected to this SCP, which governs the 2PA, and then it enumerates all of the users and all of the roles within, that, uh, within those accounts and deletes all the invalid tickets, tickets which do not have a TTL or a TTL that elapses too far along in the future. And whew, uh, <laughs> we got that out of the way. Uh, now it's time to set out and actually implement the data plane SCP, which relies on 2PA tickets. And it's surprisingly short. You can see it here. Uh, what it means is that you are denied from deleting an S3 bucket or an RDS cluster unless you have a 2PA ticket attributed to your own source identity, which kind of makes sense. Looking at this uh, specific condition here uh, and analyzing it, um, we came to the conclusion that this is the way uh, that we should handle the escape from a deny statement. And we took that same condition and we planted it into control tags themselves, thus creating the pseudo functionality needed to change the meta file, right? So Itamar and I, acting as two admins with a, a 2PA ticket, can now add an admin uh, control tag or even a autonomy or foobar or whatever to any role in the organization, thus creating some sort of a privileged role which has access to some tags, but is uh, not connected to the tags that admins can tag. Once we got that uh, piece of SCP working on our organization and we actually saw in production that you're unable to delete clusters 
and buckets without a two-person approval, the next logical step was saying, let's try and make it more granular. Make it so that some functionality is denied only on some resources. Itamar is here to tell you about the second feature that we developed. OK, so um, we've seen our actual primitive building block, which is control tags. Um, by leveraging control tags, we can actually say who can tag what. Um, and then we introduced a feature um, of guarded actions um, that two people need to collaborate to um, actually perform. And now we want to introduce another level, another dimension of complexity, um, and making two um, people collaborate in order to act on one specific resource. So let's imagine we have um, uh, AWS Secrets Manager, and we, oh, I thought we removed that slide. Removed we, it. it was a pun, pun intended. Um, um, right, so um, let's imagine we have an AWS Secrets Manager um, secret, um, which holds like a recovery key for something, for your Bitcoin wallet or something, um, that you don't want anyone to see or access um, without um, being uh, collaborating with another person. So we want to seal this resource, we want to seal this secret. And a seal is just another control tag. Um, we designated it to be, again, under the um, meta um, subtree. Um, and the value of the seal um, actually denotes what the seal is doing. So currently, uh, the seal is set to total, um, which probably means um, that I can do nothing. I cannot interact with the secret. Um, but this resource is totally sealed. So we have two admins there. Um, the first one um, is uh, operating by himself, um, and he tries to describe the secret. Um, and that works, um, because he should um, see how the resource is stacked. Um, but then he tries to reveal the secret, um, and that doesn't work. Or um, try to mangle with the tag, uh, still doesn't work. Uh, it can't access this resource by its own. And then we have another um, admin role, which has a 2PA ticket, um, was collaborating with a friend, um, and they can um, describe, mangle with the tag, or do whatever. So, seals are um, a good way to freeze some or all functionalities on specific set of resources. Um, so, as we see now, it's um, really useful on LBS Secrets Manager, um, but it can be super useful if we're going to think about trust policies. What if um, we seal a role's trust policy? Um, we have a role um, that we want to escalate into. Um, and in order to escalate to this role, we'll have to um, perform a 2PA in order to assume. Um, but then we don't want anyone performing on its own um, to be able to change the assume role policy. So it wouldn't make sense. So let's see how it works. Um, <clears throat> we have an IAM policy now, um, which has, um, I think, three statements. Um, and the first one um, is quite the most important. Um, we'll see we have two conditions there. Um, but we deny anyone from updating assume role policy. Um, and this statement takes effect um, if we don't have a 2PA ticket and the role is sealed with a sealed value that is called the night trust update. So if the role is sealed with another value, it doesn't work. If uh, it doesn't take effect, um, and if um, the role acting has a valid 2PA ticket, it still don't take effect, so we can bypass it. So that's the first statement of how we can bypass the seal. The second statement um, and the third one are quite, um, let's say, technical um, because we don't want people from changing the seal without having to pay tickets. So that's the first statement we see here. And another one, um, we want to disallow anyone without any established identity um, from interacting with the seals um, because all of the 2PA world is actually 
heavily relying on human identity um, and um, uh, identity provider setting a source identity. So this one is uh, pretty um, important. But for not, <laughs> they are this near. Um, and you is going to show us how we extended this seal mechanism into EKS. Thanks. We set out on a, another goal, which is to extend that uh, notion of approval of 2PA from AWS IAM into Kubernetes. Those of you familiar with Kubernetes authorization system know that using an ARBAC model is probably not powerful enough to implement something like a two-person approval, not natively within EKS. Uh, however, EKS does support uh, uh, authentication using AWS IAM. So if we configure our EKS clusters uh, AWS auth config map in such a way that there's a regular admin and a super admin, and the regular admin is not allowed to create uh, new EKS uh, Kubernetes roles and Kubernetes role bindings, which are the equivalents of IAM policies and policy attachments, um, which, lives it, which lives it in a state where it cannot easily escalate into super admin credentials. And if we provision that same super admin user, this is Terraform code, by the way, uh, in such a way that it is tagged with a 2PA seal with a deny trust update value, plus an assume role policy, which is the trust policy, which only enables to assume that super admin role if you have a 2PA ticket, right? That's the same statement that which we saw earlier. This little pattern uh, we like to call a 2PA trust relay, and it's very powerful to relay that notion of approval from AWS IAM into EKS. Let's see something that looks more like a production or a business uh, uh, use case, where you have an assumed breach of an hacked admin role. That role is the entry point, and that attacker is interested in harvesting sensitive data from an S3 bucket. However, the system is enforced. It's enforced by several ways. The buckets policy allows only a sensitive role to get object and put object, which is fairly standard. But it also requires a 2PA ticket in order to change the bucket policy itself. The sensitive role is guarded by a 2PA seal for deny trust update. And the super admin is configured uh, just like the super admin which we saw earlier. And it's all running inside a pod on an EKS cluster. Now, as an attacker, first thing I'm trying to do here is S3 get object. Uh, and it fails. But I, then I try to remove or change the bucket policy, and it also fails. The second thing I'm going to try to do here is to assume the sensitive role, right? Because it's the entry point to the bucket. Uh, but I cannot do that. And I can not change that uh, sensitive role's trust relationship because of the 2PA seal. Right. Next, an attacker is trying to target the AKS cluster itself. It's going to try to exec into the pod or maybe uh, try to edit the AWS config map for authentication or maybe create and attach roles and roles binding, role bindings. And this is kind of a sensitive process, but if we uh, configure the, the admin user correctly inside the AKS cluster, uh, the attacker will, will not be authorized to do any of those. The next thing an attacker might try to do is assume the super admin role and then try and execute uh, kubectl commands in order to try to do what he did earlier. But it will fail again because the super admin role requires a 2PA ticket in order to assume. The last, and it's kind of more complex thing to do here, is for an attacker to try and create a new IDP, 
like integrate a new Okta account where he creates multiple users, uh, associates them with the hacked admin's role, and have user one attach a 2PA ticket to user two. But this will also fail, surprisingly enough, because the new identity provider which the hacked admin created does not have the Meta Identity Broker attached to it, so it cannot set source identities into the system. And the list goes on, uh, but it, it's kind of a pain for an attacker to uh, actually get into a system like this, and the only thing that an attacker might be able to do is rely on some um, weakness of IIM or just hack the identity provider, one of the allow listed identity providers themselves. Uh, to conclude, we found out that uh, control tags are a viable uh, production ready system. We're using it for uh, similar web production accounts, around uh, 15 accounts for the last 18 months. And the, um, the system itself is used by uh, more than 10 infrastructure engineers. And we're using it for all of the things that you just saw, plus uh, creating additional uh, SCPs to guard IPs. So even if our credentials do leak outside, uh, they are unusable. And of course, we can uh, override that with a control tag. That way, we don't have to worry about some developer or some um, escalation path, which create a gap in the security. Uh, and uh, also, yeah, it's a, it's it's a, it's pro, uh, it's essentially essentially a free system because IAM operations don't cost anything. We are only paying for the Lambda. Thank you very much. Was there any questions in the room? So how do you build confidence in this being correct? Right, you've got a lot of uh, sort of meta policies going on and IAM is not in general, a good language for expressing meta um, con meta controls, right? Yeah. Uh, so how do you how do you gain confidence, for example, that you know those attacks that you listed out, but then other ones are also not possible? Uh, the core concept of the control tags here is that this is a living living and breathing organization, and it has legacy tags. So we're not trying to fix those, and every ABAC system that's built on top of those is essentially broken by design. Uh, and what we're trying to do is implement our organizational SCPs in a way that only uses control tags, or to a maximum extent. Uh, the control tags themselves, are, it, it's, it's uh, kind of easy to prove that mathematically. You just assume something, and then you get a contradiction, so it's false. Well, right. And are you using a solver for that? Like, is no. That there's no solver okay. needed. Well, you say that, right? Right. But you're making an assertion without, like, what is the evidence then that you have done this correctly? A mathematical proof. Okay. That is specified uh, with a pen and paper, not okay. an SMT. Right. It's a self-referencing. Uh, uh, tagging construct, sort of like a cl members only club. Sure. You have to have this specific uh, grant path in order to tag with control tags. But that grant path is a control tag itself. Right. So the only way to bootstrap that system is to make sure that there's an admin role with the admin control tag and at least one IDP with the meta identity broker set to true. Right, and then it's implemented in IAM. Yeah. And that implementation can be incorrect, right? So if you, if you exchange and, you know, string equals if exists for string equals, that may be wrong. You're correct. And so, you know, the pen and paper side is all, is all well and good, but yeah. how, how do you build confidence in, in the implementation side of it? Uh, we tested several scenarios, right? Um, it's not just a blank implementation, mm -hmm. and we got the results that we wanted. It's, okay. a, it's a combination of tests and like the, the, the proof itself. I, I just want to add that um, it's really hard to test this. I mean, you cannot write unit tests for it. Um, visibility is really hard. 
Um, even if we're talking about um, um, uh, a user actually trying to um, interact with the resource and he gets an access denied, it's really hard for him to, to know why. So that is really hard and one of the, the pitfalls of, of this. Um, and we did have some outages um, when trying to implement this. Um, but then we, um, we reached a stable state. Um, and it's um, short enough. It was really different at the, at the beginning, but it's short enough. Um, it's like uh, five, six um, um, statements. Um, we're confident enough to, to use them in production. But it takes time, of course. Like you said, you've been using it for about 18 months. How often would uh, people go through like requesting a uh, 2PA ticket? Is it the sort of thing that you do once a day or once a month? Multiple so, times a yeah. day. If, if you take a look at our Slack channel, um, then um, you'd probably see 2PA ticket in one. Um, so we have um, many things um, which are, um, let's say, um, restricted on our infrastructure that we want a review, um, and that's a good way to enforce a review. Um, so it's just 2PA ticket and one, go on a quick zoom. So I guess um, the follow-up question would be, uh, the human factor, do devs at your company express frustration and say, I don't like this, let's turn it off, or have you found it's so, manageable? So it's mostly an admin feature. Um, devs w w won't do, um, things that are um, as restricted in the infrastructure. Uh, you mentioned that this is a really uh, user-based system. How does uh, operational things like CICD and IAC work within the system, especially when they think need, might need things like put bucket policy where an admin might not necessarily want or need that? One of the uh, more advanced features that we built on top of that is actually hooking it up to a CICD system. We create uh, two roles. One is the executing role, which uh, Terraform uses, and uh, the other one is uh, the approval role. So there's a system within GitLab uh, to query the person who gave the approve button versus the person, the people, actually, which uh, contributed or authored the merge request. And like on real, uh, like uh, just in time, uh, two PA ticket on the executing role once it's applied. Very clever. Uh, just to uh, re recap that uh, like scenario, the approver itself is guarded with a 2PA seal. And yeah, so this, it, this is like exactly the same cat and mouse game going on. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting. What does the auditing and uh, auditing process look like for this? Um, so it's mainly CloudTrail. Um, it doesn't give much. Um, and it's really a pain. Visibility, is, it, it is a pain um, with this solution. Um, we did see um, on the last announcements from AWS that they have um, um, now some error codes um, denote which SID was denying you. Um, and it works well with SCPs and most of the control planes uh, statements are, uh, are an SCP essentially. So it helped, but um, CloudTrail, just CloudTrail. Uh, um, so I like the design of the system. My question is, how did you go about implementing it? Because I see it being something that like, okay, if you're starting net new, you know, fresh accounts, new accounts, I could see this working, but trying to apply this to brownfield seems like it would be really difficult. So how did you approach that? It was relatively easy to integrate it into existing accounts. When we started this system, we already had 15 accounts in production. And the trick here is to just pick the prefix for the control tags to a prefix that you're not using in the organization. It's pretty easy finding like prefix such as this. And uh, once you got it, you just uh, tag the first admin role and the first IDP and you're uh, set to go. Anybody else? There was one question from Slack in a comment, uh, and I think it picked up on something that was already asked, actually, is 
how difficult was it to debug your access denied error messages? I think that goes into the SCP stuff. Uh, one addition there, though, is did you build any special tooling to make that easier? Um, yeah. Um, we actually have a CLI called Intra, um, which uh, helps us give the 2PA tickets because um, you'd, you'd have to calculate the Unix timestamp, and then we want it to be um, in uh, the interval of four hours or, or so. So we have a CLI that acts on your behalf uh, and just stacks um, and gives 2PA tickets. So that one thing we do. Any other questions before we go? All right. Thanks. Good job, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.